So hello, everyone. I'm Hima Vaidula, and I'm here with my co-governor of the New York ACC, Dr. Hari Naidu, and welcome to this evening's annual New York Cardiac Center lecture. The New York Cardiac Center is led by Dr. Wolk, who is a professor at Cornell and former president of the ACC. And before we introduce our esteemed speaker, just a few reminders. We'll have a Q&A session at, after the presentation. Please remember to enter your questions in the chat box. And so with that, um, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Deepak Bhatt. So Dr. Bhatt obtained his undergraduate degree at MIT. He then received his medical degree from Cornell and his MPH from Harvard. He trained in internal medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and in cardiology at Cleveland Clinic. He completed fellowships in both interventional cardiology and peripheral interventions there and served in many leadership roles at Cleveland Clinic. Following that, he served as the chief of cardiology at the VA Boston Healthcare System and subsequently as executive director of interventional cardiovascular programs at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He's also previously served as a trustee of the American College of Cardiology. And as you all well know, he's now the director of the Mount Sinai Heart. Dr. Bhatt, we are so happy to welcome you to New York and really appreciate your support of the New York ACC. Hari, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, just uh, as people are entering the room, I wanted to just say that I've known Deepak, Dr. Bhatt, for quite some time now since I finished fellowship. Uh, my early memory of him was when I was finishing fellowship at Penn, uh, I asked my mentors, uh, if there's anybody I could talk to, and there's only one name they came up with, which was Dr. Bhatt. So I remember being in the fellows room uh, as a fourth year international fellow, and I called Dr. Bhatt, and he was very gracious with his time because uh, he had trained at Penn for part of his training as well, I think, for internal medicine. So uh, I think it's important for people to see that there's a lot of connections out there, and everybody makes it by uh, having these connections and learning from everybody, no matter what stage you're at. So I do appreciate that, and it's wonderful to remain friends with him all this time. This topic, I think, is very intriguing. I think, uh, you know, I don't know what he's going to talk about, but I think as an interventional cardiologist, we're always used to being the tail end, like if all else fails, something needs to be fixed, right, potentially. And obviously there's controversy around that. But I think what's happened now is that we realize the cath lab is, is also a starting point where when patients finally come into the cath lab and we notice things, there's probably a wealth of things that we can do to, uh, from a secondary prevention standpoint to improve their overall outcomes. And that's reaching into renal function and other function now as well. So uh, let's see what we have in store with Dr. Bot. But thank you again for coming and take it away. Great, thank you very much. Are you able to see my slides and hear me well? We can. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you very much to both of you for that kind introduction and to the New York chapter of the ACC for uh, having me here tonight and to Dr. Wolf as well for sponsoring tonight's event. It's, it's really wonderful to be able to join uh, the New York cardiology crowd. I'm really happy to be back in New York. Uh, I've gone to medical school at Cornell here and uh, I'm at Mount Sinai now, and it just uh, really feels wonderful being back in the city and in the state once more. So uh, what I was going to talk about was really a whole range of topics from intervention to prevention uh, with a launching point uh, of the management of acute coronary syndromes. These are my disclosures and relevant to tonight's talk are multiple research relationships with companies, uh, and that research is some of what I'll be presenting. I'm also going to be talking about things that are off-label and investigational, both with respect to drugs and devices. So there are multiple causes of ACS. The most common one, of course, is plaque rupture. Probably 60% of patients with ACS have an underlying plaque rupture as the cause. But there's also plaque erosion, which has increasingly been recognized as a cause of ACS, in particular, a recognition in women that plaque erosion is a cause of ACS, ACS though it occurs in men as well. And much uh, less frequent, but very tricky to treat, uh, can be ACS due to a calcified nodule. For many years, we thought calcified disease is always stable disease, and while that might often be true, there certainly are situations where calcific nodules present as an ACS and can pose uh, quite uh, a number of challenges uh, to the interventionist in terms of techniques and technologies to, to deal with that sort of calcification. But these are some of the um, I'll say more common causes of acute coronary syndrome. There are less common causes, but nonetheless important ones, such as coronary artery spasm, spontaneous dissection. That's been 
something that's been increasingly appreciated in patients. Again, this is something that is more common in women than in men, although it does occur in both sexes. And embolism is a rare cause, but uh, something to keep uh, in the differential as well. And then about five to 6% or so uh, of ACS or this category known as MI with non-obstructive coronary arteries or, or Minoka. Now here is a coronary angiogram uh, of a patient uh, who presented with an acute coronary syndrome. What you can see here is the coronary artery and diastole and then systolic compression of the mid part of the LAD. I'm not sure if my pointer is actually showing up, probably it isn't uh, here in Zoom, but uh, in the mid portion of this panel B in the LAD is evidence of systolic compression. So this is a myocardial bridge. And that is something that would very rarely be associated with acute coronary syndromes. But in this case, it was. In fact, we even did um, a measurement of the FFR or fractional flow reserve uh, across this bridge and uh, found it to be below 0.8 uh, at a value of 0.76. So one could say then associated with ischemia. We ended up medically managing this patient. It's very unusual uh, to stent in these days, even more unusual to bypass these sorts of of segments uh, that are tunneled in the myocardium um, and the patient did well on, on, on medical therapy. Uh, but just it goes to show that there are all sorts of causes of ACS uh, that one has to consider, including uncommon ones. Here's another ACS patient, uh, more coronary angiography uh, shown is the 99% mid LED stenosis in panel A, and then some nitroglycerin is administered intracoronary. And there is moderate improvement, uh, though still some moderate uh, plaque seen on the angiogram. And then in the right coronary artery as well, there's some non obstructive plaque that's uh, seen. Now on MRI, we see moderate uh, atheroma in the LAD, and again, also in the RC. And it turns out that most spasm uh, does occur with some underlying atherosclerosis that may or may not be visible on an angiogram, but, but is often there. Uh, this particular patient actually presented quite dramatically with ventricular fibrillation, and uh, shown here uh, are uh, some tracings in the hospital of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. And he was a patient, actually, that was young, uh, went out on uh, medical therapy, calcium channel blockers, nitrates, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but unfortunately, I guess sometimes, as young people do, stopped all his medicines and came back uh, with recurrent uh, ventricular arrhythmias. So rare cause of acute coronary syndromes, but something to, to think about. As far as the overall algorithm for managing acute coronary syndromes, this is from a recent JAMA publication. And, uh, basically, the ECG remains the primary mode of determining whether something is an ST signal elevation MI or a non-ST signal elevation MI. Extremely important branch point. If it's ST signal elevation MI, their initial antiplatelet and anticoagulant therapy is delivered. A uh, trip to the catheterization lab in most uh, regions of the world is now standard of care. Uh, and if that's not possible, say in rural parts of the U.S. or in, in certain regions of the world, their fibrinolysis remains an important therapy. But even then, uh, there should be transfer for uh, PCI consideration within the next 24 hours or so. But the majority of patients do end up in the cath lab then either uh, emergently or uh, somewhat urgently. And then if there is a stenosis, typically that's treated with PCI. And if there isn't, uh, then myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries is diagnosed. Now, a lot of patients with ACS these days are NSTEMI or non-ST simulation ACS. That's more common than STEMI for sure in the U.S. and, and, and really um, in almost all regions of the world at this point in time. The initial therapy in terms of medical therapy, antiplatelets, anticoagulants is similar, but there in particular high sensitivity troponin testing uh, is uh, the standard of care. I, I realize probably it uh, is a source of aggravation for many people on the call, but in, in, indeed it is the standard of care. And increasingly, uh, these uh, high sensitivity troponin assays are being adopted around the world. And if positive, an NSTEMI is diagnosed. And uh, if not, uh, unstable angina is diagnosed. That's become less common as a diagnosis. Some had said with sensitive enough troponin assays, it would disappear, but it hasn't quite disappeared yet. It's still there. And, you know, some of that might have to do with uh, coding and chart documentation and so forth. But clearly there are some patients with real unstable angina whose initial ECG and troponin um, 
um, are consistent with that diagnosis. And in those patients, if they're high risk features, such as heart failure, dynamic ECG changes, ongoing chest discomfort, hemodynamic instability, of course, uh, they should all be whisked to the cath lab as well. But for those patients with low risk ACS, their initial medical therapy and a non-invasive evaluation is reasonable. That can be a stress test. Increasingly these days, and I think even more so in the future, this will be a CT angiogram. And if abnormal, whatever that non-invasive testing is, well, then those patients should go into the cath lab anyway. And if that isn't abnormal, then continuing medical therapy and lifestyle modification risk factor control is quite reasonable. STEMI in particular, I think it's important to, to acknowledge that it really has to be coordinated uh, care. I remember when I was in Cleveland, Cleveland Clinic, the city really uh, did a nice job moving towards streamlining the care of STEMI patients and making sure that they went to the right hospitals that were PCI capable, even if that wasn't always in the financial interest of, of hospitals that were bypassed in other regions of the country, you know, have done uh, similar sorts of things. So uh, important uh, to be part of those networks such that primary PCI can be uh, delivered. But in real life, in, in certain regions of the country and world, you know, patient might not be near a hospital that's capable of PCI. Uh, and there, it's particularly important to be part of a network and a STEMI network. And thereafter, initial stabilization patients should be promptly transferred for PCI. But if that can't happen, you know, within an hour or two, then full-dose fibrinolysis is still a very effective therapy with more recent data suggesting that the dose should be halved in those that are 75 years of age or older to decrease the risk of intracranial hemorrhage. And those patients as well, as I mentioned before, should still be transferred to a hospital capable of PCI. I'm going to mention some guidelines that came out a year ago, or I guess now it's a little over a year ago, in 2021, the chest pain guidelines from the ACC and the AHA. And I really thought these guidelines provide useful advice to the practicing clinician. Uh, they were really meant to be user-friendly in a way sometimes historically guidelines haven't been. And there are many aspects of the guidelines, but they're summarized in what I think is this very nice uh, cartoon. Uh, first of all, reminding us that chest pain means more than just chest pain. That is, there are a variety of symptoms that can re represent true coronary ischemia, that high sensitivity troponins are preferred. And, and, and most, but not all hospitals in the U.S. have switched to this. And as I mentioned, even globally, there's a, a rapid transition to these high sensitivity troponins. And yeah, they can you know, create some headaches sometimes uh, when they're obtained in the wrong clinical situation. But in someone presenting with chest pain, uh, of course, uh, very reasonable that data support doing it. Uh, the E in the chest stands for seeking early acute uh, care. Uh, the S is shared decision making. The T is for reminding us that testing is not routinely needed in low risk patients, trying to avoid the problem of over testing. The P is a reminder to use clinical decision pathways. Uh, the A is to remember accompanying symptoms and particularly to remember that women may be more likely to present with accompanying symptoms, though both sexes are most likely to present with chest pain, at least in the context of ACS. Uh, the I is to identify patients most likely to benefit from further testing. The N is non-cardiac, which is in, atypical is a term, is out, uh, and the S is for a structured risk assessment. So uh, a nice uh, acronym, I think, you know, with chest pain. But some highlights that I'm going to mention regarding these guidelines are that these were the first US or international guidelines for evaluating chest pain, uh, that the recommendations are for both acute and stable chest pain, that they incorporate the use of contemporary imaging techniques, and that the emphasis is on unique aspects of evaluating women with chest pain, including microvascular disease and non-obstructive coronary artery disease, Moving away, as I just mentioned, from atypical chest pain as a descriptor, because oftentimes uh, that leads uh, to inappropriate or undertreatment of patients who may in fact have cardiac ischemia. And, and then finally, an emphasis on intensification of preventive therapies, which is going to be the focus of much of the rest of this talk. I'll also mention, sort of plugging these uh, ACCHA guidelines a little bit further, is that these are really patient-centric guidelines. So this, these aren't guidelines about stenting or bypass surgery or stress testing. These are guidelines not focused on a test or a procedure, but rather on a patient and how they're presenting. And I think it's a very 
uh, important way of uh, thinking of guidelines, that is uh, focusing on the patient, how they present, as opposed to how we as physicians may react to them with various forms of, of testing or treatment. So let me first start with LDL cholesterol, particularly important uh, in the ACS patient or in patients at high risk uh, in general. Uh, and Odyssey Outcomes was a trial of patients who had an ACS one to 12 months prior. So it's not very acute ACS, but it's history of ACS. And these patients uh, were randomized to placebo or a PCSK9 inhibitor, alirocumab in this case. Uh, an injectable uh, way of lowering LDL. And what was found was a large reduction in LDL consistent with uh, many other trials. Uh, but in terms of major adverse cardiovascular events, you can see here about a 15% uh, relative risk reduction in a number needed to treat of about 49 patients for four years. So a positive trial, a significant reduction in ischemic events. Uh, now, some thought the reduction was modest, but you know, again, it was a relatively medium-term trial. I, Imagine with longer term follow up, the curves would have continued to diverge. Another point that some raised was well, you know, these are expensive drugs at the time uh, being, at least, you know, maybe a mortality reduction would have been nice. And first of all, I'd say mortality reduction is a very high bar to set in medicine, including cardiovascular medicine. But, you know, we did examine mortality in the Odyssey Outcome trial, and it turns out. Uh, that there was a reduction in mortality, uh, though it was uh, largely confined to patients whose baseline LDL was greater than or equal to 100 milligrams per deciliter. Now, again, I think if the trial had continued longer, uh, even uh, patients with LDL at baseline lower than 100 would have still derived benefit, including an all-cause death, would probably need a 5, 7, 10-year trial to show that. Uh, but at least in uh, post-ACS patients, uh, on statin therapy, on other good medical therapies, a majority getting revascularized. When the LDL is greater than 100, it does appear that there's a potential not only to reduce MACE, but even all cause mortality. And just to move beyond specific therapies, I want to introduce this concept of cholesterol years. And this is meant to sort of mirror pack years of tobacco use. Everybody learns about pack years of of tobacco use in medical school and to ask about that. This is a similar sort of concept, but thinking about cholesterol years. That is, how high is the cholesterol? For how many years has it been elevated? And both really contribute to the area under the curve. So if you had, for example, a patient with severe hypercholesterolemia from birth, that's a pretty high risk patient because their cholesterol has been high right out of the gate. On the other hand, you know, if you have patients with more modest degrees of hypercholesterolemia, they're perhaps the time and threshold at which to initiate therapy will be lower than the first type of patient I described. Um, on the other hand, there are going to be some patients with good lifestyle, good genetics, you know, who have relatively low LDL cholesterol, but potentially if they live long enough, even they are going to be subject to the development of atherosclerosis, and one might consider that lower is better even in such patients uh, as the data evolve. And uh, speaking of that, uh, you know, this is um, uh, from an accompanying editorial uh, from the EPIC uh, STEMI trial, looking at very early initiation of PCSK9 inhibition in patients presenting with MI treated with primary PCI. And here, um, it really, I think, uh, supports this concept of very early initiation of potent LDL reduction, uh, including PCSK9 inhibition. And uh, this particular trial wasn't powered for clinical events. It was looking at LDL cholesterol and safety and that sort of thing. Uh, but I think perhaps in the future, in addition to starting things like aspirin and P2Y12 inhibitors and high dose statins on presentation in the ACS patient, maybe uh, prior to discharge, at least if not on the day of presentation, uh, azetamide, PCSK9 inhibitors, icosapentethyl, and, and, and blood pressure and, and uh, glycemic control optimization should all be part of this recipe of care uh, for a patient that's presented with a true ACS. In terms of what's coming down the pike in ACS patients and LDL control or trials uh, such as the Evolve MI trial, this is meant to be a, a real world pragmatic trial taking patients with NSTEMI or STEMI, randomizing them to routine care uh, versus uh, a PCSK9 inhibitor or evolocumab in this case. It's a median study duration that's projected of about three and a half years, so hopefully long-term enough follow-up 
uh, to see some incremental benefit, if such exists, of very early initiation uh, in the hospital of a PCSK9 inhibitor. And the trial is well underway. Now, LDL is important, but even if one lowers LDL to very low levels, blood pressure still matters. These are both independent risk factors, and that's shown in this Mendelian randomization study. If you're not familiar with these types of genetic studies, what is done here is a look at patients and their genotypes. So different genotypes associated with different levels of lifelong LDL and lifelong blood pressure. Uh, and so this is nature's way, uh, genetically, of randomizing people at birth to different levels of cholesterol and blood pressure. And what it shows is in these different levels of LDL uh, that uh, nature is producing in an individual due to their genetic makeup, um, there is still a lower rate of cardiovascular events if the blood pressure is lower, even in the lowest quartile of lifelong LDL cholesterol. So. Yes, you might be lucky and born with good genes, maybe have a good lifestyle on top of that, have low LDL cholesterol, but it seems it's still having a low blood pressure counts and is independently important. So it's not just a matter of doing one thing, it's a matter of doing both. And this is basically a graphical representation of the concept uh, that lower is better. Now, it's a little bit easier with LDL because there are lower is better. And to date in randomized trials, we haven't detected safety issues with low levels of LDL cholesterol attained for uh, a uh, few to several years, not decades, but, but at least uh, several years. With blood pressure, of course, there's a certain point where a lower is just going to cause more side effects, and that can be patient-dependent. But nonetheless, as a general concept, lower blood pressure to the extent tolerated without side effects and lower LDL cholesterol is a good thing to strive for. Now let me move from blood pressure, and that was a rather cursory uh, sort of look at blood pressure, uh, to talk a little bit about elevated triglycerides. Now, elevated triglycerides, some years they've been in, some years they've been out as a cardiovascular risk factor, a lot of uh, controversy, in fact, uh, through the years. Uh, I think they're in again, uh, but it probably depends who you ask. But there are a lot of different therapies for hypertriglyceridemia, old therapies like high doses of omega-3 fatty acids and newer therapies, uh, such as uh, the one right here. Uh, molecular medicine, um, targeting RNA to lower triglycerides. And this approach, uh, which is in uh, phase two and phase three testing, has been shown to lower triglycerides by a lot, uh, even more than 100%. So really, large reductions in triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. When I say triglycerides, really it refers to triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. So we'll see if these large reductions in triglyceride levels translate into reductions in cardiovascular events. That will really be the proof or, or perhaps lack of proof of whether uh, triglyceride-rich lipoproteins are truly an independent cardiovascular risk factor. I think they are, but, but we'll see from uh, these uh, the series of ongoing trials examining this. Uh, but you know, right now we do have drugs that lower triglycerides like fibrates, which have not been shown to be effective to reduce cardiovascular events, and omega-3 fatty acids at higher doses which in some cases, but not all cases, have been shown to reduce cardiovascular events. It's a bit of a confusing story with the triglycerides uh, and uh, with the omega-3 fatty acids. And I'm going to, at least in a minute or two, try to uh, make some sense of, of that situation. And I think it depends on the exact type of omega-3 fatty acid. So of course, always good to do things naturally if you can, and there are natural, uh, including vegetarian and vegan sources of omega-3 fatty acids. Things like chia seeds, flax seeds, walnuts, uh, some green leafy vegetables are pretty high in, in um, uh, content of good omega-3 fatty acids, things like alpha linolenic acid. Uh, but um, their conversion to other omega-3 fatty acids like EPA or icosapentaenoic acid in the middle of the slide, pretty inefficient. Um, uh, some estrogen-dependent steps there, so a little bit more efficient in premenopausal women, but still not that efficient even there. Really, the best sources if uh, one eats fish is marine oily fish uh, to get uh, icosapentaenoic acid, or down here at the bottom of the slide, docosahexaenoic acid. Those are two of the better known omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and there are multiple enzymatic steps that uh, are shown here. Uh, some of the science is still in evolution where we're not 100% sure. I mean, this isn't like the Krebs cycle where it's pretty much the same as what most of you memorize in medical school here. Every few months, this uh, diagram would need to be updated. But uh, icosapentaenoic acid or EPA and 
acid and DHA are the two primary omega-3 fatty acids that have been studied for cardiovascular uh, protection. And the studies of mixtures of EPA and DHA have uh, largely been uh, neutral or even negative. Uh, while the studies of EPA to date have all been, generally speaking, positive. And, and I think this has to do with the fact that these are very different moieties. Uh, they are both omega-3 fatty acids, but as you can see, their chemical structures are different in subtle but important ways. And the downstream mediators they produce are also somewhat different. And it's really these downstream mediators, things like hypocinoids or F3 isoprostanes or specialized pro-resolving mediators uh, that are very potent anti-inflammatories, different from things like CRP or interleukins or so forth, very uh, different pathways uh, of inflammation. And omega-3 fatty acids seem to have uh, an important effect in quieting that inflammation. And the clinical trial results, at least for EPA, I think are quite clear. These are data from the reduced trial with icosapendethyl at a high dose, four grams a day, showing a significant benefit on cardiovascular events, including heart events, CV death, MI stroke, including cardiovascular death, which was significantly reduced in the trial, uh, large relative and absolute risk reductions uh, with this therapy. And to focus specifically on patients with prior MI, uh, here we see in that subgroup of patients also large relative and absolute risk reductions in the primary and uh, key secondary endpoint of cardiovascular death, MI stroke. Uh, and we see this for first events, those are the lighter shading, and for total events, that's the darker shading. And that includes not just the first event in the trial, but, but recurrent events. So a uh, very large risk reduction seen here. Uh, across the board uh, in patients with prior myocardial infarction. And, and cardiovascular death, as I mentioned, was reduced in the overall trial significantly so, uh, also in the patients with prior MI. Though here in the subgroup, the absolute risk reduction is even larger than in the overall trial, as one might expect, uh, that an effective therapy um, would be even more effective in, in higher risk patients. Now, why might it be that you know the data for EPA uh, seem so positive and the data for mixtures of EPA and DHA seem so negative. There haven't been pure DHA uh, cardiovascular outcome trial. Well, I think it has to do with a variety of important biological differences. Here you can see EPA and DHA and their effects in this biological model uh, on the phospholipid bilayer of cell membranes where EPA stabilizes those cell membranes and DHA, on the other hand, is disrupting those cell membranes. Uh, so, in fact, you can imagine a trial of EPA plus DHA. Well, maybe EPA is trying to provide cardiovascular benefit, and then DHA is undoing the benefit. So not causing harm, per se, but negating the benefit that EPA would otherwise be expected to provide. And if that's the case, why does DHA exist in nature? Well, I I think it probably does have important biological roles, just not in terms of reducing cardiovascular events. Uh, DHA and the cell disruptive, uh, cell membrane disruptive ability might be useful, for example, in the developing retina or the developing neuron. In fact, you uh, see an infant formula in the US, it's uh, stipulated that DHA be included in it because of that belief, not that the data is super solid, but, but the belief that uh, DHA is good for the uh, developing infant brain. Uh, so uh, it's not to say e EPA is good and DHA is bad under all circumstances, but for cardiovascular risk reduction, EPA uh, is proven uh, now in the reduced trial, but, but uh, several other uh, trials as well. And sometimes, you know, I think at a distance, it seems like, uh, you know, omega-3 fatty acids, maybe they're all the same, but, you know, it'd be similar to saying hormones are all the same and doing a trial, say, of estrogen and testosterone in men and women and concluding that hormones don't work. Well, you know, that would be a flawed experiment. Of course, hormones work in the right patients if you're giving them the right hormone for the right condition. I think it's the same thing with omega-3 fatty acids in human health. Uh, there are other sorts of experimental models as well. I, I just showed you one. Um, this is a different one, uh, looking at membrane structure and electron density. And, you know, it's late at night, so I'm not going to uh, really get too much into uh, electron density other than to show you the signature of electron density in red for EPA and blue for DHA. Uh, very different signatures. So again, you could say, oh, they're all omega-3 fatty acids, but they're having very different biological effects. Let me move now from triglycerides to diabetes. That's an important cardiovascular risk factor. Everybody knows that. And these are data from Saver Timmy 53, where we looked at causes of death in stable patients with diabetes. So these aren't ACS patients. In fact, the opposite. This is secondary and primary prevention outpatients diabetes. 
And the majority of deaths in these patients, two thirds are due to cardiovascular death. So diabetes is really a cardiovascular disease. And I'm glad that so many uh, cardiologists have gotten in along with endocrinologists and nephrologists into trials of diabetes because heart disease is a big part of this. And of that cardiovascular death, a lot of it is sudden cardiac death. That's this uh, dark red at the bottom, 30% of these deaths. So the problem there is a lot of times that's out of hospital sudden cardiac death and it's just death because those patients are never successfully resuscitated. So that's why aggressive treatment of people with diabetes and their risk factors, uh, such as uh, hypercholesterolemia, are, are so important. Now, when we look at the real drivers of cardiovascular mortality in this patient population with diabetes, at the top of the list is prior heart failure that ends up being the most potent risk factor for cardiovascular mortality. And it really points to the fact that if one has heart failure, uh, that is um, a bad thing, obviously, but coupling diabetes with heart failure, that's a double whammy, it really accelerates the course of heart failure. So it's important in terms of initiating heart failure and then more rapid progression. So uh, in particular, these patients that have both diabetes and heart failure, uh, really got to be careful about them because they're in for trouble with respect to their heart failure risk, also with respect to ischemic risk, myocardial infarction, stroke, peripheral ischemic events, et cetera. And there is a lot that's been done as far as chronic heart failure therapies and developing treatments for patients with recent myocardial infarction. This slide just quickly illustrates some of those things like ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, beta blockers, milocorticoid receptor antagonists, RNAs, SGLT2 inhibitors most recently. Uh, and, and this is what I really want to focus on now, that last part, the SGLT2 inhibitor. These are really a remarkable addition to the heart failure armamentarium. That's true in patients with diabetes. It's also true in patients without diabetes. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through the multitude of slides that are uh, trials that are displayed on this slide, but really we see benefits uh, across the range of types of heart failure, ejection fraction, and, and again, um, the different levels of diabetes status, either having it, uh, having impending diabetes or no diabetes. In all cases, we're seeing benefits in terms of preservation of normal ventricular function in those that start with it, uh, and in uh, patients with actual heart failure, either with or without diabetes, uh, marked benefits. Now, what about the patient with ACS? Uh, those patients are at high risk of developing heart failure, especially after, say, a big anterior wall MI, but even after a non-STEMI multivessel disease, a, a fair proportion of those patients develop heart failure. And there are two ongoing trials of patients who presented with ACS who are at high risk for heart failure. They either have it or, 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 or uh, at high risk for it based on things like ejection fraction or other parameters as listed on the slide. And there are two trials, DAPA-MI and IMPACT-MI, that are both slated to finish enrollment uh, sometime relatively soon, follow up hopefully in the next couple of years. And then we'll see whether patients who present with an ACS who are at high risk for heart failure, either with or without diabetes, would benefit from an SGLT2 inhibitor. So if these trials are positive, yet another potential indication for the use of SGLT2 inhibitors beyond diabetes, beyond heart failure, beyond chronic kidney disease. So, you know, we'll see what the trials show, but uh, uh, stay tuned. Uh, let me shift gears now a little bit uh, to a different form of therapy in high-risk patients, and that's dual pathway inhibition. Here, I don't mean dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, everybody's heard a lot about dual antiplatelet therapy through the years. Here, I'm talking about a dual pathway inhibition. An antiplatelet, most often, or at least what was studied, aspirin, uh, plus uh, an anticoagulant. Here, I've got to be brand specific. It's rivaroxaban. And dose specific, it's 2.5 milligrams twice a day. Uh, that's what was studied in the COMPASS trial, and that was what was the winning regimen. Uh, what is called often a vascular protection dose of rivaroxaban, much lower than the AFib dose. In someone with normal kidney function, that'd be 20 milligrams once a day for a fib of rivaroxaban. Here we're talking about rivaroxaban 2.5 milligrams, so much lower dose, and twice a day. The lower dose requires a, a, a more frequent dosing interval. So um, that plus a low dose of aspirin in the US, that's 81 milligrams a day. Uh, that was found to be the winning strategy in stable CAD and PAD patients enrolled in the COMPASS trial, beating aspirin. 
Uh, and that's what's shown in blue versus what's shown in red. Now, black was uh, rivaroxaban only. I mean, it actually was a little bit better than aspirin, but the p-value uh, wasn't quite significant uh, depending on how you looked at it certainly in the primary analysis. So uh, that unfortunately wasn't proven as a, a viable option, though I think it probably would have been. But but at any rate, the winning and approved uh, FDA approved strategy here is uh, the uh, reduced dose or vascular dose for roxaban plus aspirin. Uh, and in the overall trial, there was a reduction in CV death MI or stroke. In the patients without diabetes, there was a significant reduction in CV death MI or stroke. And in those with diabetes, an even larger reduction in CV death MI or stroke. And for the endpoint of all-cause mortality as well, there was a significant reduction. As you can see, the hazard ratio is below 1.82 to be specific, so a significant reduction in mortality. Now, there's some degree of debate about this. I gave you my interpretation of the data, but strictly speaking, that p-value of 0.01 did not meet the p-value we pre-specified in the trial to say that there was a significant reduction in mortality. But I would say don't hold it against us or the trial because uh, we stopped the trial early because the Data Safety Monitoring Board said stop the trial early because among other reasons, there's an overwhelming clinical benefit, including a significant reduction in mortality. So, you know, they stopped the trial or they recommended stopping the trial early and uh, that ended up happening. Uh, and I'm not sure we could have continued a trial when a data safety monitoring board is saying in the trial. Uh, so, um, you know, I do believe had the trial continued even longer, uh, this mortality benefit would have been even stronger in terms of p-values and even larger in terms of magnitude. Now, these data are looking at the benefit of dual pathway inhibition versus aspirin as a function of time from the most recent PCI. Not everyone in Compass had PCI, not everyone had an ACS, but there were patients that had both, that had neither, and there were benefits uh, really in, in all those quadrants, that is, yes to ACS, yes to MI, no to ACS, no to MI, or uh, either of those disease states uh, in, in isolation. So the benefit was really quite consistent in these CAD and PAD patients. But here we're looking specifically at patients with a history of PCI, and this is more remote PCI. If you had a, a recent PCI, you would have been ineligible to be in the trial because if you were on dual antiplatelet therapy, you weren't supposed to be enrolled in the trial. But uh, therefore, this is more uh, remote uh, PCI. But you can see here, if we go to the time of that PCI, Patients had a significant benefit if they were randomized to DPI versus aspirin in the trial, even if their PCI was up to 10 years ago. And this was true even for the endpoint of all-cause mortality. So these are data that support the value of being on more than aspirin alone in a patient who's undergone PCI, who's at high ischemic risk and low bleeding risk. Supportive of that concept are data from the Themis PCI trial, totally separate trial. This is a trial of patients with stable diabetes, uh, specifically the large subgroup of 11,000 patients who underwent PCI or had a history of undergoing PCI. And here we see in this trial that randomized patients to dual antiplatelet therapy versus aspirin, uh, specifically ticagrelor plus aspirin versus aspirin plus placebo, also a significant benefit in major adverse cardiovascular events. In this case, going out again to 10 years, statistically significant out to about seven years or so, six to seven years. So totally different streams of evidence, different trials, different populations showing the benefit of being on two antithrombotics versus one. In this case, it's uh, DAPT or Ticagalor specifically. In this case, it's uh, reduced dose for Roxaban with the aspirin. So these are Totally different trials, different agents, but the same bottom line message that uh, carefully selected patients really do benefit from being on just uh, more than just aspirin alone. Now, whether that should be clopidogrel alone, ticagrelor alone, should it be aspirin plus reduced dose for roxaban, you know, that'll need to be sorted out in a series of future trials. But, but, uh, but the concept here is, in the message here, is we can do better than aspirin as our uh, antiplatelet. Uh, now let me move on uh, to another drug and another concept, uh, and that concept is one of self-treatment for acute coronary syndromes. That might sound crazy, but it's already common for certain emergency conditions, uh, such as heroin overdoses treated with naloxone, as you know, hypoglycemia treated with glucagon, anaphylaxis treated with adrenaline-filled pens. Um, that's very common among uh, people that have, say, food allergies uh, or parents of, of, of children that have that. And there's a lot of that out there. So a fair amount of familiarity uh, with this concept of self-treatment 
for those types of conditions. Even in ACS, we do recommend self-treatment with aspirin. But what about injectable therapies, maybe coupled in the future with remote monitoring with wearables uh, for ACS patients? Well, you know, uh, I, I've got to put in a plug for uh, Mount Sinai in New York here and, and Mount Sinai alumnus, Dr. Stanley Sarnoff, who created a pen uh, for lidocaine for self-injection in patients with a possible MI in the early 70s. And that was based on research during World War II in which he developed an injection pen for atropine for military use, obviously. Uh, for the potential sequelae of chemical warfare. So, you know, why not then consider perhaps the same approach in acute coronary syndromes? I mean, it's an important uh, condition. It's common. Uh, bad things can happen. Well, there is now a drug that's been developed for subcutaneous self-administration. It's called Slidergrill. It's an ADP receptor antagonist. Uh, and uh, there's an injector that's been developed, and a lot of science and engineering went into developing the injector, uh, obviously, as well into developing the drug. And, you know, this is being tested in a large uh, cardiovascular outcome trial called SOSMI, where patients with a history of a uh, uh, STEMI or NSTEMI in the past month are randomized to this concept of self-injection with this drug versus placebo. I don't know if the trial will be positive or not. Uh, that's why we do trials to find out. But, but even if it isn't positive, I think this concept of studying uh, patient-initiated therapy for ACS is really quite innovative. And uh, even though we didn't do it in this trial, you know, maybe if there is an SOSMI2, we actually would incorporate wearables. So it's not just a matter of a patient sort of thinking, yeah, this pain feels like the last time I had a documented type 1 AMI, but taking it one step further where maybe there's um, transmission of their ECG from their watch, their smartwatch, and, and a more refined uh, assessment of whether they really are having uh, the big one again. Now, let me say a word about conventional and non-conventional risk factors and SMURFs. I don't know if you've heard the term SMURF, Standard Modifiable Cardiovascular Risk Factors. And so it turns out there are some patients in, in STEMI and even STEMI that don't have uh, these Smurfs, patients without Smurfs. And I think a good proportion of them are patients with Smurfs, but they just weren't treated. That is folks that have, you know, LDL that's out of control or smoking, but for whatever reason, those risk factors aren't treated, maybe due to the doctor, the healthcare system, the patient, some combination. Uh, but I think part of it also is the patient really doesn't have identified risk factors. Maybe in the future, you know, things like LP will A will be recognized uh, as a treatable risk factor. Trials are ongoing to see uh, if it's a modifiable risk factor. It's clearly an independent risk factor. And, you know, things like inflammation, you know, uh, that's bad to have inflammation, but can targeting inflammation uh, reduce cardiovascular events? You know, trials are ongoing to, to see that. So, so we'll find out. But, but there are other things that I think even right now are, are, are clearly cardiovascular risk factors, non-conventional ones, but they're often not thought of as such. And I think it's important to realize that pregnancy is a cardiac stress test. And I think those of us involved in the care of cardiovascular patients actually should take an obstet uh, obstetric history, even though many times we're dealing with women at a much later stage in their life. Now, what happened perhaps years or even decades ago, I think is still relevant to their cardiac risk assessment as summarized on this slide. So for example, you know, things like preeclampsia or gestational diabetes, or just having a little bit of hypertension during pregnancy, a lot of times that's written off as just being, well, you know, there's excess volume from the pregnancy and, and that sort of thing. And, and if it resolves in, in the postpartum period, it's often forgotten by the primary care physician or, or ob guide physician. Uh, but I think it's important to realize that's addressable cardiovascular risk at that stage of the woman's, woman's life. And it hasn't been done then. Uh, still important at a later stage uh, to realize that what happened back then essentially was a cardiac stress test. And if the woman failed, such as with development of elevated blood pressure or glucose, that really uh, means uh, intensify their lifestyle uh, management in terms of cardiovascular risk and maybe uh, uh, medical therapy if appropriate. Uh, other sorts of things to think of uh, include race. And, you know, there's uh, uh, clear evidence now that South Asians are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease. That's true of South Asians in South Asia. It's true of South Asians in the UK, South Asians in the US, wherever they seem to go, uh, they seem to carry an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And is that due to traditional risk factors that are undertreated with lifestyle modification or medicines or some combination of that? Is it due to a higher prevalence of non-traditional risk factors or genetics or something? 
I don't know, it's probably a combination, but what we can do is address what we do know, which is traditional uh, risk factors and, and uh, evaluating uh, evolving risk factors. And I do think in the future, especially if randomized clinical trial data support, you know, assessment of risk in uh, particularly high risk populations such as CAC scores, maybe even coronary angio CT is going to become much more common. Obviously, before just endorsing that, we'll need randomized clinical trial data supporting such broad approaches. But, but I think in very high-risk populations, such as South Asians, it's, it's certainly something uh, that uh, may become the standard of care, again, depending on, on future data. Other sorts of things to consider in terms of evolving risk factors are air pollution. I mean, climate change is occurring. Uh, I don't think that's controversial among this audience, hopefully, uh, but as a byproduct of that, there's um, a lot of things that air pollution can do to affect human health that includes cardiovascular disease, not just acute coronary syndromes and MI, uh, but even arrhythmia and heart failure risk. And there are ways even now to mitigate some of this risk, you know, wearing uh, an N95 respirator could be useful, but uh, I don't think that's going to be very popular, especially as we're coming out of a pandemic. But there are uh, systematic things that can be done, such as HVAC filters. We learned from the COVID pandemic, in fact, that air filtration really matters. I don't mean just in hospitals, I mean in offices. Uh, so potentially a lot of those lessons can be applied to reduce uh, the risks of air pollution. Uh, and not just cardiovascular risk, even pulmonary uh, and other risks. Another risk factor, uh, I, I don't know that it's fair to say it's an evolving risk factor, it's actually been known for a while, uh, is marijuana use. Uh, and the use of marijuana is growing in the US, perhaps uh, even worldwide. Uh, and there are lots of different risks of marijuana that pertain to the cardiovascular system, things like platelet activation, oxidative stress, uh, hyperdrenergic state, uh, myocardial effects, uh, concomitant uh, use of other drugs like cocaine and amphetamine and, uh, and, and even just tobacco. So um, really uh, an important uh, an increase in cardiovascular risk factor. These data are, are a little bit uh, old, uh, but you can see here lots of uh, marijuana use throughout the country. You can see California or, uh, um, and you can see New York State there as well. So something um, to really counsel patients about, because a lot of patients, even a lot of doctors don't know of that association of marijuana use and cardiovascular risk. Now, the final couple of points I want to make before wrapping up have to do with things that perhaps aren't um, super sexy, but things like uh, adherence, which uh, is really important if any of the things I mentioned are going to matter. Uh, and you know, in clinical trials, we say patients have high adherence if they're taking their pills more than 80% of the time. It's not really such a great bar that we set. And in real life, rates of adherence are, are even lower than that. You know, recently, um, the SECURE trial was published in New England Journal of Medicine. Dr. Fuster was the chair of that trial, uh, randomizing patients with uh, prior myocardial infarction to a poly pill strategy or usual care strategy, showing a significant reduction in ischemic events, uh, including CV death, MI stroke, including also cardiovascular death, which was significantly reduced. Uh, New England Journal of Medicine doesn't allow the p-values to be put, but you can see here the hazard ratio of 0.67, 95% uh, confidence interval up to 0.97. So, uh, significant reductions in cardiovascular death with this approach. So hopefully, you know, in the future, um, uh, this uh, approach of many pills bundled in one will uh, be more broadly adopted. It certainly was associated in the SECURE trial with better adherence. I think that's the primary uh, mode of benefit. Patients are just more likely to take one pill than they are to take multiple pills. I do want to make a comment about influenza data uh, showing uh, the association of worse outcomes in STEMI patients who have influenza. The same thing is true of heart failure. If you also have influenza, you're going to do worse. Perhaps that's not a surprise to anyone. But this is from a meta-analysis from, I guess, a decade ago now, where we looked at randomized trials of influenza vaccine versus control they were done for the purposes of showing that the flu vaccine reduces influenza, but uh, we were looking at ACS and we found a significant reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events with the influenza vaccination. And that seemed to be largely confined to patients with a recent ACS versus those with stable CAD. Uh, and we saw a lower rate of CV mortality, not statistically significant, but heading in that direction. 
More recently, the IMI trial had looked at influenza vaccination versus placebo and found a significant reduction in cardiovascular events and also a significant reduction in CV death. So, you know, that signal we saw on that early meta-analysis seems to have been corroborated in a proper randomized clinical trial. And, you know, we updated the meta-analysis with uh, those data and basically uh, shows a significant reduction in MACE with influenza vaccination. And again, it seems to be predominantly in those at highest cardiovascular risk, such as a recent acute coronary syndrome. The final study I'm going to mention is a SuperWIN trial, uh, and this was uh, the first randomized clinical trial. It's designed by my former fellow, Dylan Steen, uh, to look at a randomization uh, using uh, diet and using a grocery store as the patient to do, uh, as the place to do the trial for the, um, the patients where they were randomized to a control group or one of two strategies of uh, delivering education about the DASH diet, and then we monitor adherence to the DASH diet, which, as you know, is a very healthy, um, a low-sodium diet. And um, I won't get into the specifics other than to say there's a control arm. Strategy one was the nutritionist delivering education to the patient and their significant others in the grocery store aisles, uh, and then a superimposed uh, strategy where that happened, plus there was an online component of education as well. And uh, lots of um, detailed uh, dietary histories that were obtained. Uh, uh, but the bottom line is we looked at uh, the DASH score, and there was a significant uh, improvement in the DASH score with either of these strategies. So the overall trial was positive, as we published just uh, last month in Nature Medicine. And um, it did seem the strategy that added the online version to the in-person was even better. Uh, so um, uh, proof that uh, nutritional education really works. And, you know, the COVID trial did hamper, uh, even though the trial was positive overall, did hamper things, of course. And if we looked in the pre-COVID aspects, uh, there was an even larger absolute uh, benefit with respect to adherence to the DASH diet. So finally, I would just say uh, we're at a stage in cardiovascular medicine where we're redefining residual risk, focusing not just on cholesterol-related risk, but in the future inflammatory-related risk, thrombotic-related risk, triglyceride-associated risk, if the trials bear out LPLA-related risk, and diabetes-related risk. And I think it's important when thinking about patients who present to us with syndromes such as acute coronary syndromes, uh, to realize we're just dealing with the tip of the iceberg. And that sort of secondary and tertiary prevention is important. But really, uh, we've got to think as a cardiovascular community of focusing increasingly on primary prevention and even primordial prevention, that is preventing the development of risk factors in the first place. And that's largely community and public health efforts, things dealing really with fetal and infant health, smoking cessation efforts, efforts to encourage physical activity, maintenance of a good body weight, uh, controlling pollution, and uh, counseling on diet. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I hope this uh, overview uh, of the transitions in ACS patients uh, from intervention to prevention has been useful and interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deepak. That was a whirlwind tour, and I think um, really educational people to see the whole field on the different areas that we can impact. Uh, there's a lot of questions in the uh, Q&A, and I'm going to cover a few of them with my first question. There's some questions about the poly pill or about compliance and about cost and adherence, some of those issues. As I hear what you're saying, I think one of the challenges is in, in cardiovascular medicine, we've oftentimes focused on what their substrate is. Is it diabetes? Is it heart failure? Is it ischemic disease? And we have individual therapies that we randomize to show a benefit. But these, even when we go into individualized medicine, we still don't look at things like, well, what is their main risk? Is their main risk heart failure? Is their main risk stroke? Is their main risk recurrent MI? Is their main risk sudden cardiac arrest? And then figuring out what is the biggest bang for your buck amongst, um, amongst all the different therapies that we have. Otherwise, you could potentially be on 30 different medications, and it might be that it's better to do DAPA than it is to do DAFT in certain right. situations. So how do we individualize that, that concept? Otherwise, we're just getting larger and larger, but being less and less impactful. It's a terrific question. You know, challenge in randomized clinical trials is we're usually not studying combinations of medicines. You know, we're studying one medicine versus placebo, much less frequency, one drug versus another drug. And, and therefore, it does make it a little hard to, to answer your question in a totally evidence-based way. But to the best uh, of anyone's uh, ability to assess, it does appear that all the medicines I mentioned are really incremental in their benefits in the right patients. Uh, but unfortunately, the cost can also be incremental. 
uh, and potentially depending uh, on the drugs, the side effects can also be incremental. So I think, you know, some things are, are kind of obvious. If you just put in a stent, you know, DAP for the nef next month is absolutely critical. You know, you, if the patient can do one thing and they can't afford much, just get them on aspirin and clopidogrel. You know, statins are generic, extremely cheap. Uh, of course, the internet says there are all sorts of bad things that happen, and patients uh, do tend to believe a lot of that, sometimes even the doctors. But, you know, I think getting people on the maximally tolerated dose of statin, whether it's secondary prevention or high-risk primary prevention, is easy and cheap. Azetamide, a lot of times people forget about that. Again, it's generic. It's really cheap. There are virtually no side effects. It's not systemically absorbed. There's occasional GI side effects, but not much. PCSK9 inhibitors, other than local skin reactions, haven't seen much in the way of side effects, you know, concerns about dementia or becoming stupid from low LDLs haven't been borne out, at least in the intermediate term follow-up that's been seen uh, to date. So, you know, these are medicines that I think, you know, should be used in many patients. Now, PCSK9 in Brazil, there's a cost issue. That's a health systems issue, really, you know, got to set up healthcare systems so that, you know, it's not you and your busy clinical practice between cases, you know, trying to do a pre-auth or, or your already overworked nurse trying to fit that in. That's got to be a system in place. And, you know, I think um, healthcare systems have to evolve such that there are ways of handling that such that the individual physician practice isn't overly burdened. Uh, and, you know, ways of targeting those sorts of therapies so that, you know, society isn't overburdened by costs. And there, I think, you know, it's a matter of focusing on patients whose absolute risks are the highest. So, you know, for example, somebody that's already had multiple ischemic events, assuming that they're generally an adherent patient, you know, that's who you really would want to throw the kitchen sink at. You know, therapies that cause bleeding, like long-term DAP, long-term dual plant, uh, pathway inhibition, there I'd probably add that on later uh, sort of in the algorithm, that is, if the patient really is taking their statin and their azetamide and so forth, you know, there I would think of stacking on those sorts of therapies. So it, there's no easy answer to your question, but I think, you know, good physician judgment always has to be employed. It's not just a matter of following an algorithm or guidelines and always throwing the kitchen sink at every patient because then they might actually end up taking nothing. That's great. So, so another question that I found, I found your slide about pollutants and environmental exposure is interesting. And and that also marijuana in that uh, we kind of have kind of liberalized it. You're in New York now and it's, it's legal now, right? So there's right. A cannabis everywhere. Every, every uh, other, other corner has a, has a smoke shop now that has cannabis now or edibles. So what do you think uh, would take to, to make that link and to try to push back on that if it needs to be done? Because, I, because at this point, since it's legal, the overwhelming evidence, at least uh, we haven't pushed back to say that there's significant harm. Yeah, great question. I mean, smoking is legal, you know, multiple drinks a day is, is legal, and all those things are associated with significant cardiovascular and societal harm and economic uh, harm. Uh, so, you know, it, it's a challenge, you know, a lot of uh, children of the 60s, you know, uh, would light up. So it, it, it may, maybe many people in the audience uh, did that, maybe some still do. So, you know, it can be kind of difficult uh, at a societal level to, to change behavior when something is not only prevalent, but becoming more prevalent. You know, Massachusetts also legalized uh, marijuana dispensaries popping up all over the place, uh, sometimes neighborhoods trying to fight it, but whether it's in the city and suburbs, they're basically all over the place in Massachusetts, and it seems the same thing's happening here. So I, I think the problems will go up, not go down. And the other thing I didn't mention is vaping, and sometimes the combination as well. Vaping, I don't know how many of you have kids in high school, vaping is extremely common in the U.S. right now. And, and whatever you think the incidence is, it's higher than you think it is. So it, it, it's extremely addictive, even more so, I think, uh, overall than tobacco, maybe not on a biochemical basis, but on a it's cool to do it basis. Uh, so I think that uh, this is a big problem that's going to be coming up, uh, vaping among young people if it doesn't stop, uh, much like marijuana. Uh, but I'm not, um, again, I don't think, you know, there's an easy solution to this other than education. That, that is, a lot of people, including physicians, primary care physicians, probably including some cardiologists, don't, aren't even aware of that association between marijuana use and, and, and myocardial infarction. I mean, you know, classic work uh, from Murray Middleman, cardiologist to Harvard, uh, from years ago showed um, the time dependent that is, if you light up a joint, that is, in the few hours afterwards, there's a real big spike in MI that comes down. It's not a randomized clinical trial, but, you know, randomized clinical trials weren't done for proving tobacco is a carcinogen or, or a cardiovascular uh, uh, harm agent. So the data are there. The evidence is there. I think we just got to get the message out and, and hope people are listening. But it could be tough. could be very tough. There are powerful lobbies, you know, mm -hmm. that are behind, say, vaping, for example, marijuana as well. It's big, big money there. You know, when I was talking about uh, 
uh, big pharma and device companies and uh, all the evil influences they have, that's nothing compared to the supplement in industry or, or marijuana or vaping. I mean, uh, it, it, those companies actually really know what they're doing in terms of influencing human behavior. And one last question. Two people asked a question about LP little a. I mean, the field has gone from really fractionating all this and, and focusing on LDL and triglycerides and um, and then it moved back towards just high intensity statin because it's almost all we had and the data was poorer for everything else. And now it's going back a little bit. So what, what do we do with LP little a and um, and should we be being more specific about that? Perfect question. It's definitely an independent cardiovascular risk factor. The ESC guidelines say measure in everyone at least once in their life. I think that makes sense. There, there's a lot of genetic uh, influence of, of one's LP little a level. But is it actionable? Randomized clinical trials are ongoing. They'll be out in the next few years. And I'd say wait to that before doing anything too specific as far as drug therapy. But in the interim, I'd say if the LP little a is high, intensify everything else you're doing, in particular LDL control. And there's certainly data from the PSCSK9 inhibitor, PCSK9 inhibitor trials, that if the LP little a is elevated, you get even more bang for your buck from lowering the LDL to low levels. So I would say, you know, there, if somebody's LP little a is high, their LDL is high, I would definitely go ahead with the PCSK9 inhibitor and not just you know overly worry about the cost or cost burden because that's a really high risk patient. That's about all that you could really do to offer therapy. Now, I mean, there are other things that have been done in the past, but you know, it's not really clear that things like nice and provide cardiovascular benefits. So I, you know, I, I wouldn't do that anymore. I, I would focus on LDL control, including with PCSK9 inhibition if necessary and if otherwise appropriate for that patient's secondary prevention uh, at this point in time per the labeling. Thank you so much, Dr. Butt. Um, I think we're just at the hour. So we really appreciate you taking the time to support New York ACC. And um, sorry, we couldn't get to all the questions, um, but thank you everyone for attending. Uh, we really appreciate your time and have a great evening. And we hope to see you at ACC 23 in New Orleans. Yes, thank you both for having me. And again, thank you to the New York chapter of ACC. And uh, as well, if anyone had any questions that we didn't get to, please just email me directly and I'll answer them. Thank you all very much. Bye now. Thank you, Dr. Bob, and thank you, our amazing staff. Thank you.